I'm Philippe Gangin. Uh, I am a professor and chair of environmental medicine at the University of Southern Denmark, and I'm also adjunct professor at Harvard School of Public Health. Now, we did a study in collaboration with colleagues from the United Kingdom because there is a birth cohort, a cohort of 14,000 children that were born in 1991-1992 in Bristol in England. That cohort, called the Altsback cohort, uh, has information on the children's development and also for many of the children they have information on their genetic composition. They tested the children at age eight to me because they also had in the freezers a piece of the umbilical cord for several thousand of those children. And we then decided the umbilical cord for mercury. We were able to determine if mercury in the, the mother's diet um, being passed through the placenta to the child and, and part of that located in the umbilical cord was toxic to the brain so that we could see deficits in the IQ at age eight. Now, the, the short story is that we didn't see any effect of mercury on average at age eight. Actually, we saw tendencies that it looked beneficial, but of course that's because methylmercury comes with fish and there are essential nutrients in fish, so that's why it looked beneficial. But then we did a systematic study of uh, the genes that are important to brain development and also possible uh, of importance to uh, methylmercury metabolism in the body. And we found that there were 40 mutations that one way or another uh, was associated uh, with either brain development or mercury concentrations in the umbilical cord. And those mutations we then examined in, in a more sophisticated statistical model and it turned out that four mutations were crucially important so that if a child had uh, one or two mutations in those genes, that child would be much more vulnerable to methylmercury. So that we saw the mercury associated decreases in IQ at age eight only in the children with one or more mutations in those four genes. And when we looked at all of the four genes together, it turned out that um, children who had no more than one mutation in all of these four genes, they were essentially resistant to methylmercury. We couldn't see any effect on the IQ, but those children who had uh, four or more mutations in the genes, they were highly vulnerable. In fact, a tenfold increase in mercury exposure was associated with a loss of 25 IQ points at age eight. This is like, this is so much that uh, we, we were very surprised. On the other hand, there is actually research that has been carried out in the past looking at individual genes that does suggest that th this is an important phenomenon. Some researchers have looked at other genes, uh, and I also want to note that uh, such research has been done in regard to mercury vapor, and there are also genes that are clearly important in determining whether a subject is vulnerable to mercury vapor in, in regard to uh, brain toxicity. So uh, these findings show, uh, they show that um, mercury toxicity is unevenly distributed in the population. There are subjects who are very hyper susceptible to uh, developmental uh, methylmercury exposure. And the consequence is, of course, we should not uh, develop our risk assessment based on the average sensitivity in the population. We should definitely protect 
the most vulnerable subsets of the population because only then will everybody be protected against methylmercury toxicity. And th this is crucial because it's the brain power of the next generation and we know that such effects, they don't disappear, they stay with us for all of our lives and therefore we, we need to um, make certain that we protect those who are most vulnerable. Thank you.